Well, it was a bit of an oopsie, um, definitely an accident, so not on purpose. They do routinely send uh, commands to Voyager, uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, this one's Voyager 2. They do routinely, routinely send packets of information, and unfortunately, in this little packet of information they sent, they had a little error, and the little error said, please rotate yourself two degrees away from uh, where your antenna's pointing at Earth, and two degrees doesn't sound like a lot, right? Uh, but when you are 20, almost 20, billion kilometres away and if you're any good at trigonometry and if you're a maths teacher you can get in year nines <laughs> to do this you can work out that makes a pretty big difference over that space yeah <laughs> yes and because it's a robot Voyager did what it was told and um, you wouldn't want to be the one to have to put up your hand for that mistake would you <laughs> No, I mean, I guess it's unlike you nine students. It, yes, the robot yeah. does what it's told. <laughs> <laughs> and every year nine teacher is hearing you. So look, they've picked up, they've picked up a heartbeat. Uh, what does this tell us about the options they have to try and reconnect? Well, the great thing is, so, so I've heard it described as uh, billions of times weaker than the power coming from your wristwatch. So we're yeah. talking really, really weak signals, but they've managed to pick it up using, um, we've got these antennas in this deep space network and we've got some in the uh, US in California, some in Madrid, and we've actually got one in Canberra in Tidbin Billa, say that 10 times quickly. <laughs> and this antenna actually is designed to pick up these really weak signals. So they sort of heard this very weak signal from Voyager 2. This means that Voyager is still broadcasting. It's still, well, relatively healthy, I suppose. It's just that it's not quite pointing where it should be. So the hope is here, now that we've actually gone, yes, we found it, yeah. Uh, the hope is maybe to try and send some packets of information to get it to reorient. Now, I don't know, uh, 160 bytes per second. It's not a lot of information. It's very, very slow and it takes over 18 hours to get there. So it's not sort of something I'd be waiting up, holding my breath for in the next hour or so, Bev, given that they only sort of found out about this morning, 3.30, I think. Yeah. So if those attempts are not successful, what's next? Well, luckily, uh, NASA's uh, design people, NASA and co, built in contingencies for this exact thing. Well, probably not this exact thing, but some of these types of things. And basically what uh, Voyager, the Voyager spacecraft do is they use uh, the position of the sun and a star called Canopus, which is a very, very bright star, so quite reliable. And periodically through the year, it actually uses those two uh, things in the sky to actually reorient itself. So the next one of those is actually due in October 15, which is a little bit serendipitous because it's quite close. So we may only have to wait another two and a bit months um, to have it automatically do it for itself, fingers crossed. Yeah. Give us an idea, Claire, of how important the, the two voyages are in terms of what we learn about outer space. Voyager program was and is absolutely incredible. First of all, they were launched in 1977. They are still sending us back information well and truly after their life frame. They were not designed to actually go for this long. And so the very first amazing thing is that they've survived these conditions out in space for some three or four times their actual uh, intended working life. So that's one thing. But yeah, they've actually, they were first of all destined to go to the planets. So Voyager 1 went Went to uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Voyager 2 actually went Jupiter, Saturn, and then on to Uranus and Neptune. And it looked at the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, but Voyager 2 actually is still the only spacecraft that's been out to Uranus and Neptune. Um, Voyager 2 found its found moons out there. So they found some, I think, 10 or 11 moons around Uranus and then a couple of rings and four rings around Neptune and, and some uh, moons as well. So it's, it's sort of incredible what it's achieved over the last 40 years. And now both of these spacecraft have actually sort of left uh, the reach of our sun. So particles are streaming out from our sun all the time. Uh, and eventually they get to this sort of shock area and they sort of don't go any further. And once uh, a spacecraft has gone beyond that boundary, which both of the voyages have, they're in interstellar space. So 
sending us information from a place that we've never ever been before and in fact probably I mean I won't I certainly won't be there ever. Yes <laughs> unlikely that most humans will be despite all the space tourism that's going on. Um, you know we, we know that the James Webb telescope really broadcasts the most amazing brings brings us the most amazing images. You've discovered another telescope that is is also promising to bring back some very magnificent photos. Well, it's, it's a favourite. Um, it's probably less known to the public. I certainly uh, didn't come up with it myself. It was in the making uh, for 11 years by the European Space Agency. I have absolutely nothing to do with it, but it is definitely close to my heart because it's going to tell us, hopefully, a little bit more about the dark secrets of our universe. Now, it's interesting you mentioned Webb because uh, when, they, when they've actually launched this uh, Euclid um, spacecraft, they only launched it uh, early July, and then it, on the 28th of July, it actually joined Webb in the same sort of area of space. So if people remember, Webb um, launched and went to this place called Lagrange Point 2. Now that's a space um, about 1.5 million kilometres behind Earth's, Earth's orbit. So Earth goes around the sun and Lagrange Point 2 is this spot in space that's about 1.5 million kilometres trailing the Earth. And the great thing about that spot is that the sun and the Earth's gravity kind of cancel out. So it's easy for satellite for spacecraft like Webb and Euclid to hang out there. Now Webb's really good at looking back in to space and looking at very far away and very, very small targets, so in close. What Euclid's able to do is about a hundred times bigger. So like, you know, huge, huge view of the universe. And so it's going to map like uh, maybe 1.5 billion galaxies out to 10 billion year, uh, uh, light years away. So it's kind of taking slices in time. And it, hopefully it's going to tell us a little bit more about dark energy. Why is the universe expanding the way it is and dark matter? What is this amazing stuff that we know is there but we just can't see? Yeah. Oh, always wonderful to talk and hear about what's new out there or, or not so new as, as you might point out, Claire. <laughs> Take care. You have a great night. Thanks, Bev. You too.